We are the open organization of lock pickers. We're going to be teaching the introduction to lock picking class. We're starting a little late, so I skipped over some of the introductory material. We're going to start you right with the meat. Uh, this is going to be about a 25-minute class, which will give you the theory of how locks work, the theory of how lock picking works, and then some practical tips on how to make those lock picks you're holding in your hands actually open the lock in a practical fashion rather than a theoretical fashion. Uh, I'm going to try to answer all of your questions as I go. Um, I, I'm hoping to preempt most of them. If you do have questions, hold them to the end, and we'll either answer them at the end or send you over to the tables where you can get the one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, and if you're having, having any trouble hearing me, just wave your hands wildly in the back, and I'll try to modulate that. Uh, to start off with, we are the open organization of lock pickers, which means we are ethical hackers. We teach ethical lock picking. The way we do that is by following these two rules. One, do not pick locks which you do not own. Variety of reasons for that. First, it's an optics problem. A lot of people think lock picking is either, either illegal or immoral. It is, in most cases, neither. Um, since we teach ethical lock picking, that's legal everywhere. Um, if you're picking locks which you do not own, you risk the uh, you run the risk of committing burglary if you succeed. So don't pick locks you don't own because it doesn't look good and you could accidentally break the law. Number two, do not pick locks upon which you rely. Uh, that includes even locks you own, even if it's your front door lock, don't pick it because if you're here, probably by definition you're a novice lock picker and you're more likely to break picks off in the lock or damage the locks, uh, in which case then a lock you rely on now is no longer in working order. So help us improve the image of lock picking and stay on the, the right side of the law by following these two rules. Uh, that emphatically goes for anything here in the venue. Uh, if you buy lock picks from us, do not hack anything in the venue. We're not going to back you up one bit on that. <laughs> kinds of lock opening we're going to be talking about. There's lock picking. There's what you might call quick and dirty techniques. And then there's covert and high tech. Lock picking is what we're going to be teaching today. That's using picks in the lock to address the lock as a coherent system uh, to work with it on its own terms. There's quick and dirty techniques, which you're uh, familiar with. The most common of is just take a credit card, slide it down the side of the door. Maybe that works. Maybe it doesn't. But you're not engaging with the lock at all. You're attacking the latch. That's a great bypass technique. It's not really a lock picking technique. Finally, covert and high tech stuff. This are, these are hardware uh, exploits. The, uh, there's something wrong with the design of the lock, not the manufacturing of the lock. I uh, need to talk louder or slower? Okay, I'll try to do that. Um, the last one, fascinating stuff. Not really our bag, at least not to teach here, not in a, in a uh, non-professional capacity. We're going to focus on picking the lock. Um, here's what lock picking looks like. If you have seen lock picking in the movies, on TV, in video games, you have almost certainly seen it wrong. Because if it doesn't have two hands doing two different things using two different tools, then that's probably not real lock picking. So uh, I want to put this up front so you'll have seen it at least right one time before we start. Two different hands with two different tools doing two different things. We'll talk about what those things are, but I want you to see it right once. The type of picks we're going to be talking about, they look like this. If you pull out your keys, probably going to look like that standard pin tumbler shape. You see it in deadbolts, you see it in padlocks, pretty much everywhere you go in North America. If there's a lock, it probably looks like this. You're used to seeing it from the outside, so this is a schematic view of something you're used to seeing. What you're probably less used to seeing is the inside of it. So now we've passed from the introductory portion to the, uh, to the mechanical portion. Here's what's going on. We've got the plug right there. That's what turns. That's ultimately what we want to happen. Preventing it from turning is a pair of pins. Not one pin, two pins. It's important because they separate. The key pin there, that's the red pin, above it is the driver pin. We try to use functional names for them because you can install them upside down as they do in Europe often. Uh, since they've been doing it longer, they say we install ours upside down, so we compromise, we give them functional names. The lock works just fine if you turn it upside down because the spring there takes away the effect of gravity and it means the whole lock works just fine no matter, no matter what orientation. When you try to turn a pin without a key, you see how that GIF shows that it's, it's going to turn a little bit, but not very far. That's the plug trying to turn, but being prevented from the driver pin. Uh, that blue pin right there, that driver pin, its job is to be in the way unless and until the correct key is placed in there. You'll be unsurprised to find that the peaks and valleys on the key correspond to the lengths of the key pins. You put in the right 
key, it pushes up the key pin to the right amount, and that split between the two pins there lines up with the split between the plug that turns and the housing that doesn't. If there's anything at that shear line right there, we call that the shear line because it's two things sliding by each other, just like a shear line fault for those of you from California. Um, okay, not, that wasn't the funniest joke, in the, but I expected something. Um, if there's anything at that shear line there, the lock won't open. So your job is to make sure there's nothing at that shear line. A key, by its nature, will solve that problem. If this, as soon as this GIF loads, that's pain in the butt running it on a netbook, but as soon as the GIF loads, it'll show you that a key pushes up the key pin to the right height, meaning that the shear line there matches up with the shear line there, and the plug can turn. If you have multiple springs, multiple, key, multiple driver pins, multiple key pins, you'll see in its normal standard configuration without a key in there that there's driver pins all along the shear line. And those key pins, key pins are different heights. So if you ever wondered, all the variation comes from the key pins, the driver pins are uniform. The key will slide in there and it will make up the difference of each one of those key pins. And when each one of the key pins has been pushed up to the right height, then there'll be nothing at the shear line and the lock will open. This is one of the better animations of the whole presentation. This is pretty sexy. Uh, as long as it's not, you know, glitching out. We'll watch it one more time. You'll see that everything goes up and down, up and down until it finally falls into the correct slot, at which point that shear line will be perfectly clear. No. That lock will open. Anything short of a perfectly clear shear line is almost but not quite open, which is very similar to locked. This lock is almost but not quite open. Clear, 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 clear. There's your problem. Hasn't been pushed high enough. That lock is almost open, AKA locked. Here's the opposite problem. The key pins don't start off in the way, but can easily be pushed up in the way if you push it too high. So this lock, opposite problem, key pins in the way, shear lines blocked, still won't open. This is an important step to realize is that um, a lot of people think, I'm just gonna pick the lock by pushing everything up to the top. That's, that's simple, I'm just gonna shove it in there, push everything up to the top. And not quite there, you're replacing one problem with another. Doesn't matter whether there's a, there's a driver pin at the shear line or a key pin at the shear line, if there's anything at the shear line, the lock won't open. <laughs> All right, we are now leaving the world of keys and we're now starting to worry about things that only lock pickers care about. Um, we're also jumping ahead one slide, go back. Go back. Thank you. All right. This is an example of a perfect world. We do not live in such a world, but I want you to think about it for a second. In a perfect world, those holes in the top of the plug, that's a top view of the plug where the, the holes have been drilled in the brass, those holes would be perfectly aligned, laser aligned right down the center. So what would happen if you tried to turn that plug without a key? It wouldn't open because you got the driver pins in the way doing their job as driver pins. Each driver pin's job is to be in the way and each and every one is doing their, doing their job working together to keep the plug from turning. Because they're all in line, every time you turn it, each and every one of those gets pinched on the shear line. The lock doesn't open. In fact, the lock doesn't budge at all. However, that's a perfect world. We don't live in such a world. We live in the real world. In the, in the real world, you can see that these are not perfect holes by any stretch, and more importantly, they're not perfectly aligned down that center line. So when it looks more like that in the real world that we live in, um, the, the pins are the same thing. The pins have uh, miscasting and they've got rust and they've got all sorts of gnarly things, which means the world we live in looks more similar to this. This line, it's subtle here, but you can see that there's a bit of snakiness here. Is that visible from the back that those are not exactly aligned? Um, that's an exaggeration. Normally you can't see it with your regular eyeballs. It doesn't matter if you can see it. If it's there, it only matters that physically the, lo the uh, lock lines up differently. So now I want you to do a mental experiment where you take these misaligned holes and you drop springs, driver pins, and key pins into each one of those, put it in the lock, and now give it a turn. Now, it's not gonna open. It's not that bad. It's gonna, it's gonna turn a little bit, and when it turns, it's gonna stop on one of the driver pins. The key word is it's gonna stop on one of the driver pins, because since they're not all aligned, they can't work together. It's like having a football ball defensive line where one of the guys is forward and all the rest of them are back. One of the guys is going to get clobbered because he's going to take the whole weight of the team. Are sports metaphors really a good one for this crowd? Okay, thank you. Um, 
So instead, what I want you to imagine is when this plug turns, one of those is pinching. Simulate this in your head. If you're turning that plug a little bit and one of those is getting pinched, you're going to have a different pressure profile if you're to reach in and lift up on those. Imagine you had a hand, you know, a very small hand, and you went in like this. Reach up. If you reach up on the first one, what's it going to feel? It's going to feel springy. You're going to feel the weight of that spring, and those pins are so small that the weight hardly matters. You're not even going to detect them. What you're going to feel mostly is the spring. Springy here, springy here, and here springy as well. This one is going to be the odd man out. It's not going to be like the others because in addition to that spring, you're going to feel a little scraping, binding, grinding, metal on metal feeling of a, uh, of a machine being used in a way that's not supposed to be used, which is in fact exactly what's happening. Um, the lock is going to leak information if you turn it a little bit, bind that one pin, then it will tell you that is the pin that is most out of line. That's the one that's in the way. If you got something in the way, what do you do? You move it out of the way. You reach under there, you lift it up, you feel that binding, grinding sensation, you lift it up just enough until that shear line there matches up to that shear line, and you get a little feedback. What's that feedback going to feel like? Sorry, I can't tell you what it'll feel like every time on every lock, but it'll feel like maybe a click, maybe a, maybe you'll feel a sound, maybe it'll feel just like a little bit of give. That's your cue that that one is set and it's time to move on. Now, when I say set, here's what I'm talking about. If you push up on that red pin, that key pin, you push it up high enough that the driver pin that was in the way is now just above the shear line and it's no longer in the way. An amazing thing happens. Auto save. As soon as you set the, the uh, driver pin to the right height, the driver pin is no longer in the way. That plug that's been wanting to turn, wanting to turn, wanting to turn, now it turns and the hole that that driver pin was in, that hole disappears. The door shuts behind it. It can't go home again. As long as you keep constant gentle pressure, as long as it doesn't turn backwards, in this case counterclockwise on you, then that pin is set and will never come back down. Um, that's not a design feature. That's a design bug that we exploit. So here's what it looks like. Uh, this, is, this is just to emphasize that the spring and the driver pin are going to be isolated from the key pin. The key pin is free to move freely. You can push it up and down all day long. It's going to accomplish nothing. You should probably leave it alone because there's nothing you can do here except mess up your, your nice set. Once you have that one pin set, the plug is going to turn. How far is it going to turn? Only until it runs into the next driver pin that's in the way. What are you going to do with that driver pin? Find it, find the bind, and then lift it up until that one's out of the way. The plug will advance a little bit more, and you're on to your next pin. You do that as many times Times as there are pins in the lock, the lock will open, I guarantee you. Uh, I'm going to back up one slide just so this animation doesn't fire prematurely. Here's the next thing that I want to have generally in your head. When you are acting as a member of the key using public, the rubric in your brain is take the key, put it in the door, turn the key. Put the key in, turn the key. When you're using the lock picks, I want you to flip that around. Because when you have a key, you set the pins, and then you turn the lock. When you don't have a key, I need you to turn first. Because only until you turn, uh, only when you turn can you find the binding pin. The binding pin is created by that plug turning and then getting stopped on one of the pins. So if you're going to pick a lock, turn first, then that creates the bind. Your job then, find the bind, solve the bind. Find the next bind, solve the next bind. Here's how it looks like in practice. We put the turning tool in, we give it a little bit of tension. That creates the bind. Where's the bind? We don't know. It's somewhere, it's random in every lock, but it's consistent over the life of that lock. Now we're looking for the bind. We weigh each one of those. What are we feeling for? Is it springy or is it something other than springy? Is it scrapey? Is it binding? Is it grinding? Is it catching? Call it whatever you like. 50-50 discrimination. Is it springy or is it not springy? Find the one that's binding. Push it up to the right height until it gives, gives you a click, gives you some kind of feedback. Don't push it too far. And then move on. Um, in a few in locks with only a few pins, this is pretty simple. There's no mental bookkeeping required. In locks with multiple pins, four, five, and six, it helps to keep track of which ones you've picked. You got to keep an accurate mental model in, in your head. When you get to the last one, that's the only one in the way. When you move that one out of the way, the lock will open instantaneously. There's no need to turn. You've been turning since the very beginning, and you've just been solving your barriers that are in the way. Does anybody want to see that again, or we want to move on to the next one? 
All right, we'll do it in practice. Here's the biggest way to screw up. Yes. Uh, pins differ from lock to lock to lock. Um, padlock four is a standard amount. Door lock five and six is a standard amount. The question was how many pins in a standard lock? There's not exactly a standard lock, but um, generally four in a padlock, five and six in a door lock. I'm going to start this one over because I want to draw your attention to what's going on here. This is the most common mistake. This lock picker is going to do everything right for two pins and then screw up on the third one. Um, we're weighing each one of those pins. We're looking for the bind. Once we find the bind, we're going to lift it to the right height, and it's going to set that pin. It's going to set one right. Notice how the, this pin and this pin are relatively short compared to that one. So this, this lock picker gets used to pushing it high. It's going to mess them up because they're going to push that one too high. As long as you have tension on there, this lock will never open until the end of time. The only way to get out of this, let go of your tension, lose your progress. You have to shake the hole at your sketch. So... Um, my rule, my suggestion to you is remember that this is a precision exercise and you're moving a millimeter at a time and you're sensing very small changes inside the lock. When in doubt, leave it alone. Say, hey, that was enough. I can always come back, but if I do it too hard, I'm going to freeze the whole lock and the most likely way I'm going to have to get out of that is by losing all my progress. So uh, think of a haircut or think of salting the soup. It's really easy to go back and do more. It's really hard to go back and do less. <laughs> Um, we're gonna, now we've moved from the theory of lock picking into the practice, what tools we want to use. I want to talk briefly about raking, which is the opposite of single pin picking. When you're single pin picking, you're touching each pin at, at a time and giving it, it's like, it's like table service. Sir, what would you like? Let me get that for you, sir, right away, sir. This is buffet style. Each pin knows two things. You're relying on the fact that each pin, sorry, I haven't been speaking to the mic. You're relying on the fact that each pin knows that it has a particular height that it wants and a particular order in which it wants to get picked. So you're going to give them a whole variety of heights and figure when it comes time for that pin to set, it will set itself, even if you don't know what's happening. And it looks like this. You put the tension tool in, you put a little tension on, it creates a bind. We don't care which one's a binding pin because we're going to run through there and we're going to set and unset a whole bunch in a row. And once each one gets its particular pin, its, its particular height, it'll set. And it's a very fast way to open a lot of locks. It's uh, not a fast way to open good locks but it's a fast way to open cheap locks. It won't make you better at picking, but it's a great way to impress Auntie M at, the, at Thanksgiving. Uh, so if you're starting off in the tables, I recommend you look for one of these two. We call those uh, single pin picks. Uh, it's good for hitting one pin at a time, great for learning. You'll find those on the tables. Don't start off with raking. It's not exactly a dark side technique, but it's more just uh, it's a shortcut, and it won't make you any better at picking locks overall. It's good for opening a lock. It's not good for getting good at opening locks. Um, I'm skipping over this. The big thing I want to get to you since uh, we're running a little bit behind is uh, counting pins. Counting pins, find something with a flat back on it. These uh, half diamond look great. If you want to see how many pins are in something it, and it's not labeled on the outside, many of them are. They'll say basic one, two, three, four, five, six. That's how many pins is in it. Locks in real life are rarely labeled. Um, in fact, I've never encountered one. Um, so if you don't know what's going on inside the lock, count the pins. Um, put a, something into the flat back, push everything up to the top, and then as you pull it out slowly, listen for those clicks. For each click, there's a pin. You have to do it multiple times, but all you're hearing is that spring shooting the pin back down. Do that a couple times until you get the same number a few times in a row. That's how many pins are in the lock. If you're just starting off and you hear one or two clicks, that's great. That's a good place to start. If you hear four, five, or six picks, meh, come back and get it later. Uh, turning tools are the unsung heroes here. They're the supporting cast that should get the Oscar but never do. Um, turning tools is how you put that all important and turn on. First, last, and always, you're putting constant, gentle pressure. If you don't have a good turning tool, you don't use your turning tool right, it's going to make the lock a whole lot harder to pick. The chief way that people make the lock harder to pick is by putting too much tension on here. Again, this is a precision exercise, so I encourage you to do what you can to put less tension. This is the wrong way to do it. You would know that even if I wasn't up here telling you because of the infomercial rule. It comes first, and it's in the black and white one. This is the person who can't boil water and needs a Snuggie because they don't know how to use a blanket. Don't be this guy. And you tell it's a guy because he chooses his fingers. 
Um, instead of using your big fat thumb and pulling, which is an inaccurate way to deliver force, I want you to use a precision digit like your index finger and wrap it around the lock and push. You can push up here, but you can push even better by going very lightly out on the end. And when you're out on the end there, the principle of leverage means you can very, use a very light tension to get the same amount of push, and it doubles the feeling of any response that you get from the lock. A little jiggle down here will be magnified, and you'll get that much more sensation. Since this is a precision exercise, you want all the data you can get. Good turning tool pressure looks like this. Barely a dent in the finger, but the finger looks all healthy. If you're pushing down so hard that you're defeating your capillary refill and your finger's turning white, that is not only too hard, that is far, far too hard. Because remember, all the push you do there gets translated down to there. All the turning that gets there gets translated into the single pin that you're trying to move. So this is standing on something that you're trying to move. Please don't do that. Uh, it'll be frustrating to you because you won't be opening locks and you'll be more likely to bend the tools. Uh, we're going to skip over that. Uh, that's what turning tools look like. Again, they don't look fancy, so people forget about them, but they're key. Um, we're going to skip that, skip that. Um on our tables, most, lock open, most locks open in most directions. In real life, you're a little more constrained, but we try to make it easy for you. Uh, padlocks tend to open to the right. Uh, some schlegs, they open right. Other uh, uh, key and knobs open to the left. Again, anything on our tables probably doesn't matter. If you have any questions, ask. Or just try to pick it and see if you can meet with success. Uh, but turning direction tends to be, uh, tends to be clockwise, uh, unless there's a countervailing reason to go other ways. Um, as I said, they're labeled on the tables. These aren't labeled. I can tell you, or you can uh, try it, and I will confirm how many is in there. You can learn how to count pins. Uh, uh, this is new. Uh, the silver part is the front part, um, and the, uh, the brown part was sort of the puckering. That's the back. Uh, if you're just starting off, I recommend going in the front. Um, Uh-oh. We're frozen. We'll make it. Uh, while I'm vamping, any questions? Oh, good. I've tried to answer all of them. Um, oh, that's, that's cute. Give me a second. The question was, I showed two different kinds of single pin picks. Is there a difference between them? The half diamond versus the hook? It's a purely a matter of personal preference. In my experience, the hook tends to make people a little bit more likely to overlift because that hook motion makes them more likely to dig and really get up there. Uh, so if you find you're having trouble with overlifting, then maybe avoid the hook. It's got its uses. It's a really good one because it, it forces you to accurately register on a particular pin rather than sliding back and forth in more of a raking motion. Uh, so they've got their strength and weaknesses, but if you find you're having trouble staying on a particular pin, then gravitate toward the hook. If you find you're having trouble with overlifting, then gravitate toward the uh, half diamond. Uh, here's the exercise I want you to do if you're just, start, just starting off. This is really worth the price of admission here. I want you to find one that says basic one on it. This is exactly what it looks like inside. It's got a spring, a driver pin, and a key pin. Don't put any tension on it. I know I said when you're picking a lock, start with the tension. You're not picking it just yet. I want you to get the feel for it. Reach in there with a uh, pick, It'll you know either one, either the, uh, either the hook or the half diamond, and just lift up on that pin. You're not trying to open the lock right now. You're not turning the lock. All I want you to do is feel what that pin feels like when you're lifting up on it. What's the spring feel like? Where is it? What's the weight feel like? Get that in your head because then I want you to put tension on and lift it again. And you got that 50-50 differential between uh, which one, what's the pin feel like when it's not under pressure versus when it is under pressure. You could think of it as what's it feel like when it's springy? What's it feel like when it's scrapey? If you can make that discrimination, then you can pick the lock much more reliably. Once you put the tension on, then of course, lift it up. Then of course, lift it up. There we go. Once you lift it up to the right height, the lock will open instantly. Congratulations, That's what, that counts as a lock, but a very simple lock. 
do it again and get used to that feeling. Um, this is the time when I take a moment out to editorialize and say, I've been lying to you a little bit. The reason I've been lying to you is I've been implying that you'll be able to feel that discrimination all the time right off the bat. It takes a lot of practice. It's very subtle. It will probably be below your noise threshold most of the time when you start off. This is about lowering your noise threshold. In the meantime, you will still be able to pick locks by lifting gently up on each pin. As long as you don't lift too high and freeze the whole system, you'll be able to pick a lot of locks just by lifting them up a little bit. So even if you find yourself in a fog and blind and don't know which is the right pin, try lifting gently on each one and you'll be able to pick a lot of locks that way. But the whole time you're doing that, be attentive to what feedback you're getting. Is this one more springy or more scrapey? Did I feel it set? Uh, I don't want you to get frustrated just because you can't feel the bind at any given time, but I want you looking out to see when you do feel the bind, be excited because that's, that's your sign that you become a more proficient and, uh, and uh, methodical picker. Finally, I want to bring your attention to um, this, which is the most common way that people actually affect the pins inside. The question that people ask me is, Preston, you told me what I'm supposed to do inside the lock. What do I do outside the lock to make that happen? And the answer is, it doesn't matter. You can hold the pick any way you want. You can stand on your head if you want, as long as inside the lock, you're able to make small controlled moves and get feedback out. This is the most common thing that happens, is they kind of put it down along the bottom of the lock, maybe rest it on their finger, and they're kind of doing this, this rock rocking lifting, this digging motion. That's fine as long as rocking lifting doesn't turn into crowbarring. If you're putting too much pressure on the lock, if, you, if you're, you're pushing too hard, then you're locking down the whole system and you're really having to dig at that pin. And eventually it means that you're going to start bending the pick. And then the pick is useless. We have to throw it away, replace it, and it costs more to run these things. So uh, for your own benefit as lock pickers and for our benefit as people putting on these events, please take the kiddies' advice relax, chill out, talk to some people, distract yourself a little bit, and if you find you're having some trouble, try loosening your tension, and when you finally do get it, I want you to say open. Say it out loud, say it proud, no matter which lock you're on, every lock open is a success. Take a moment, celebrate that, and then once you get it, go back and do that same one again so that you know you've got it. Um, and since I just killed the presentation, I think that's the end anyway. If you've got any questions, I'll be circulating around here afterward, or you can find anybody in a black shirt to ask questions too. Once again, we're the open organization of lock pickers. I'm Preston. Thank you so much for coming.